On July 6, 1991, police officer Phil Weber was assigned to patrol one of the safest areas in Provo, Utah. Around 5.30 p.m., he and a deputy from the Sheriff's Department, Mike Morgan, were working together on a routine investigation. Officer Weber was checking out the possibilities of a stolen car, and I responded to, to help him with that. 126 copy. Okay, they say it's not stolen. Uh, okay, appreciate it. When you work closely with a police officer, you gain a, a real friendship, and there's a, a brotherhood there. As I got up the road, I noticed one individual was being pursued by two others. 337, 126. Looks like we've got a fight up on this dirt lane. I called Officer Weber to come and back me up. Hang on, hang on. Wait, what's going on? What's going on? Hang on, hang on. Back hang off, Danny. Get out hang of here. Shut up. Back off now. Back off. Hey, you, come here. The come one here. saw me and, and took off running back down this hang dirt on, lane. Uh, I didn't pay attention to him at that time. I had the two others who now were very verbal with each other. Back Shut up! Now back off! Now you back to the fence right now. I got in between them and physically separated the two of them. Okay, settle down and tell me what's going on. What started all this? Troy did. Bull! Officer Weber responded and he took charge of the one individual. Look, nothing's happened here. What's going on? Now, we can do it two ways. You're intoxicated. He was very belligerent. He was intoxicated, and I was preparing to make an arrest. We can talk. Look, officer, we haven't done anything wrong here. Okay. He just started pushing me, and we got into an argument, and, and um, he was hitting me in the face. Okay. He was punching me in the face. Okay, stay, stay, stay here. Mike! I got down there. I looked down the lane, and I saw the individual who had run from us now walking up the lane with a rifle in his hand. What's going on? Get out! Get out! 337, PA 1033. 10 for unit for 1033, Bolt Harbor Drive. Provo police and fire dispatchers Susan Lester and Linda Hargadon were on duty that day. 1033 is officer needs assistance now. I'm thinking there's something wrong. There's something big time happening because Phil wouldn't call for 1033 if Phil wasn't in real danger. Drop the gun! He didn't appear to have any fear of what he was walking into. Stop where you're at and drop the gun! Drop the gun now! Put the gun down! We were shooting a number of shots, but because of the distance of 125 yards of the shotgun, they weren't having a lot of effect. 337, shot corner, we need an ambulance. 10-4, ambulance will be responding. Drop the gun now! 337, have the ambulance stop at the end of the houses. Don't have the ambulance come in. We still have him up with the gun. 10 4, we'll advise. Our paramedics and our firemen are not allowed to go into a scene unless it's secured. That's because they go into that scene unarmed, and it's not fair to put their lives in jeopardy. Drop the gun! Put it down! When I heard that Phil was shot, I couldn't believe it. And then, remembering back to the night before when I called him on the air and told him he'd just become a grandfather again, I kept thinking, this isn't fair. Phil once told me on a ride along, if he ever called for help, he would ask me if they were coming with lights and siren. And so when he called for help, he asked me, are they coming lights and siren? I said, yeah. The whole world's coming as fast as they can. Don't shoot! Put that gun down! Put the gun down! Drop the gun! Stop where you're at! Mike, I'm here. He had a large quantity of blood squirting from his neck, which appeared to be an arterial type bleed. You okay? No. No, Phil. I don't want you to lay down. I want you to sit up. He tried to lay down and was mumbling something about, uh, let me lay down, let me die. You're all right. And at that time, I thought Phil was going to die. I didn't think he would make it. Phil, look at me. You're going to be okay. You're going to be all right. As I'm holding Phil's neck, I, I'm looking through the rear window at the suspect. He was struggling with his gun and getting up into a sitting position at this time. Okay. Okay. 
I realized that Phil was very vulnerable now, sitting on the ground behind my vehicle. If the suspect were to shoot underneath the vehicle, uh, Phil's back was exposed to him. Look, Phil, deep breath, deep breath, okay? I realized that I had to, to do something to put the suspect down. No way down. No way down on me. I want you to sit up. I want you to sit up, okay? I pulled out the M14 with my right hand, still having my left hand on Officer Weber's neck. Uh, but I wasn't able at that point in time to put around in the chamber because I only had the one hand that I was operating with. I knew that I was going to have to leave okay. Phil at some time. Listen. I couldn't continue to hold on to that neck. And okay. in, in a very short Listen, time, Phil would bleed to look death. Me, You're all right. I don't want you to lay down. I want you to sit up. I take deep breaths, OK? Can I help? I was nervous at that point. I didn't yeah. know whether the suspect was going to attempt to hurt Phil or to help him. But I believed that I didn't have any choice in the matter except to, to let him help me. Don't you let go. He's bleeding. You're all right. Put the gun down! Drop the gun now! Hey, Drop the gun! Shit, my friend. Hey, back off! At that point in time, I was prepared to shoot him. Now back up! Boy, I told you to! Now stay there! I realized this was the most dangerous situation I could be in. I now had a suspect fighting me from the rear. I had a suspect in the front of me trying to shoot me. And I had to try to divide my attention between the two of them. I've never shot anybody before. It's tough to take a high-powered rifle and, and shoot another human being. Park Ranger Mike Forshee and his partner had heard the report of an officer shot on their radio. When I ran up to the scene, first thing I said was, what the heck have you guys got yourself into? I don't know, let's go down here. He's come walking down the lane and started firing. I just opened fire on someone. What's happening? Okay. I knew that an ambulance wouldn't come into the scene until the scene was secured. And that was a, a definite concern was to get them there as quickly as possible. We need okay. to go down here and get the gun away from this guy, okay? Okay. Noting the condition that Phil was in when I came up, I thought he could die. Okay, don't be messing. What kind of gun is it? It's a rifle. Officer Forsh and I went down the lane leaving our position of cover, but I felt like we had no other choice to get down there and to get the gun away from him. Okay, Mike, I'll get the gun. Okay. You cover him. Keep your hand away from the gun. Send the ambulance in. Good for Once the scene was secured, Provo Fire Rescue Units, including EMT Mike Ferris, moved in to treat the victims. I could see that uh, the officer was Phil Weber and that uh, his injuries were to his neck and also to his hand. When you lose the amount of blood that Phil lost, you, you can bleed out and die immediately. I feel legs, move your legs. Here we go. Move your legs. Okay, we're going to slide the board out. I've seen a number of people just prior to their dying, and the look that they've got in their eyes was exactly what Phil had in his eyes. When I advised my dispatch, I told them that he was critical and, and possibly even fatal. <clears throat> Phil Weber was transported to Utah Valley Regional Medical Center and put under the care of emergency physician Elmo Gruel. Okay, can you hear us, Phil? Are you ready? Okay. ready? On three. One, two, three. Okay, you can move Phil, you went there? I saw a small penetrating wound on the right side of the neck and uh, my concern was that he was bleeding internally from rupture of the carotid artery. We're going to need x-ray for a cross tape. Also on the examination we noticed that his index finger was almost completely shattered and uh, was very concerned about this injury secondarily. Phil's wife Karen came to the hospital as soon as she was notified of the shooting. I was very shocked at seeing all the blood and I could feel the tears welling up inside of me and I wanted to be strong. I really held back the tears as much as I could and I told him that I loved him and he meant everything to me. It became apparent that there was not an interruption or a laceration of the carotid artery. 
So it was elected at this point that the piece of shrapnel should be left alone because our concern was that we would create more injury trying to remove the piece of shrapnel than we would benefit from if we did. Literally, if the bullet had been uh, one half inch closer to the artery, I don't think Phil would have made it. He would have died before getting to the hospital. Despite attempts to save Phil's shattered index finger, six months later, it was amputated. Your trigger finger is pretty much your life. If you, if you don't have a trigger finger, you're not a cop. So this was a, a real traumatic blow uh, to Phil. That bothered me, as it would anybody, I suppose, that you're gonna lose part of your body. I didn't know how that was gonna affect my job. I didn't know I'd be able to keep my job. But given all the alternatives, I have nothing to complain about. I'm extremely lucky. Many times I look at him and think, I'm so thankful that he's still with me. <laughs> I don't hit anybody with it. <laughs> What's that? It's a jinx. <laughs> Phil's a very lucky guy. And I'm lucky, too, to have him with me. <laughs> that we have this time to spend together that could have been shut off. The man who shot Officer Weber was found guilty of attempted murder and sentenced to 15 years in prison. I would like to think I'm back to being the Phil Weber I used to be. He's really not the same old Phil. He's better. Today, Phil is the only Provo police officer that is qualified to shoot with his left hand and his right hand. How come there's no holes in your target? Is that shooting yours? <laughs> uh, Deputy Morgan, Mike Morgan, uh, saved my life out there. There's even a greater bond than there was before with me and Phil, before we were professional acquaintances. When you go through something like this, we fought together, we, we survived together, and we're stronger because of it. You really were shooting at my target. I was. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I was. My wife and I both firmly believe that uh, my life was saved by an angel. That took the form of uh, first aid administered uh, by Deputy Morgan by medical personnel and other officers and, and hospital personnel. Everything put together. I owe a lot to a lot of people. A lot of people put out a lot of time and a lot of effort into me personally. So I'm extremely lucky. <laughs>